Hi, this little tool will help us draw spider diagrams to communicate the quality of our decisions in whether it's if it's an organization setting then to our peers, our managers, and if it's a personal setting then to friends and family who can help us or if you're helping someone else then to help assess where that decision maker is in their decision. So we look at the six rows here appropriate frame, creative, doable alternatives, meaningful, reliable information, clear values and trade-offs, logically correct reasoning, commitment to action. These are the six elements of decision quality and we want to assess where we are on, on each of these elements. So for the first one, appropriate frame. This is about whether we have clarity on what our decision is. So this little tool called a decision hierarchy is something that you would draw when getting clarity on the frame. So the question here is, do we know what our current decision is? Do we know what our future decisions are after this particular decision is made? And do we know what the givens are? The givens are decisions that have already been made. So a common mistake here is people often put events down as givens. Events are not givens. Givens are decisions that you've already committed to. So do you have clarity on all three elements here? And if you do, then another thing to check is, is your frame too broad for you to take action? Or is it too narrow that even if you take action, it won't give you that much value? So looking at all of these things, do you have clarity on givens, current decisions, and future decisions? And are you satisfied with the scope of your frame and considering all of these give a rating from 1 to 10 on the quality of your frame so let's say that for the decision I'm facing uh, I would put it as a 5 so I'll put 5 in the cell E3 and I'll get to the next element creative doable alternatives so this is about whether we have generated enough good alternatives to pick from or are we stuck with just one or two good, good alternatives with one alternative you don't have a decision to make <laughs> you have a decision when you have two alternatives so and you definitely want to generate more than that and the quality of the alternatives should be such that and you should have at least a couple of compelling alternatives one of the big mistakes people make is they'll take a pet alternative and stack it up very disingenuously uh, with useless alternatives or low value alternatives where it becomes very obvious what the best alternative should be. That's not what we're trying to do here. We want to find out enough alternatives that we can actually do that could give us value. They should also be feasible. So how much effort have you put in in discovering alternatives and are you comfortable with the quality and the quantity of the alternatives you've generated? So on a scale of 1 to 10, what, what would you say about this? So for my current decision, suppose I haven't uh, been able to generate enough alternatives. Maybe I'm just stuck with three alternatives. Okay, so let me put this down to a 3 out of 10. Okay, meaningful, reliable information. So do I know what information would change my mind? What information would switch my decision from one thing to another thing? So if I know the kind of information that will change my mind, the next question is, what have I done to gather such information? And have I tried to gather it from reliable sources? So thinking about all these elements, on a scale of 1 to 10, where am I on information? And suppose I find that I've actually taken a lot of effort to gather information about my particular decision. Maybe I'll put this down to a 6. Okay, 6 on 10. Clear values and trade-offs. Do I know what I really want? And is what I want aligned with who I am? This is what this um, element is about. Values are deeper than preferences. Values are about who you are as a person 
and preferences are what you want in this particular decision situation. So how comfortable are you about the alignment and clarity on these two things? Let's say uh, we haven't, you know, in my particular decision situation, I haven't given much thought to values and preferences. Okay, but 2 on 10. Logically correct reasoning. How comfortable are you that the logic used to arrive at a decision is sound? Now, if you're using the, the normative principles of decision theory, then you could go high on this, where you, know, you feel that given the inputs, you've, you've got the logic down on how to come up with the decision. But if you're not going to go in a quantitative manner, then, and you, you're going to use qualitative logic, then the question is, are you doing your best to reason things out given what you know, what you can do, and what you want? Or is your logic flimsy and inconsistent? That's what we're really asking here. So in my decision, suppose it's a, it's not a quantitative analysis, but it's more of a qualitative decision. I can, and you know, I'm, let, let's assume that I'm, I'm, and I'm comfortable that the logic I'll use will be pretty sound. So suppose I say, this is a six, okay. What about commitment to action? Commitment to action is whether I am willing to carry out the decision or I just keep analyzing again and again and don't really take action. And this is unfortunately not to be underestimated. A lot of organizations are stuck in this paralysis. They just don't like making decisions because uh, in a lot of environments what happens is if you make decisions you have to stick your neck out and in risk averse cultures where you're penalized for taking risks people don't like to make decisions unless they're absolutely sure. Now, such behavior kills value because you, you're not taking enough risks. You're not putting yourself out there to discover more opportunities. So if you belong to a culture like that, then your commitment to action would be pretty low. Now, of course, if you're in a, in a in a dynamic environment where you're constantly innovating and in a very entrepreneurial setting perhaps, then once you find a good idea, you go ahead and implement it. And, you, and if, you're, if you are in such an environment, then your commitment to action would be high. At the personal level, uh, in your decision making, are you a person who, once you, once you know what the right path is, you, you're still afraid to walk? And if so, go low on the score. But if you have no issues with commitment, once you've figured out that this is the right path for me, then you should give a high score on this. So suppose uh, I'm a person who generally um, is not very comfortable making decisions, and even even when I've analyzed, I'm, I walk with trepidation and and uh, tend to remain confused. Okay, then I'll put a four here. So this spider diagram really helps me to hone in on those elements that need the most attention. So in this case, it would be clear values and trade-offs and uh, creative doable alternatives. So the moment I see this, I know that I would start with those two and try to see what we could do to improve the quality. And uh, I would also give some attention to commitment to action and uh, have, you know, and reflect basically, why is it that commitment should be so low and does it make any sense once you know what the right decision is? What could the reason be for not being committed to action? It just doesn't sound logical. So uh, commitment to action is, is really a hard one to fix without um, just waking up and saying, I'm going to do what I have de decided is the right thing for me. So this, the spider diagram is an incredibly useful tool for teams and even and individuals to communicate very clearly the quality of their present decision to their teammates so that a focused discussion can be had and teams can help each other improve the quality of decisions. Imagine doing this as an alternative to writing tons of strategy documents or lots of English text about decision situations and in a snapshot very quickly communicating what the conversation should focus on. Good luck using spider diagrams and thank you for listening.